Chapter 3 Precious Answers to Prayer Part 2 The Divine Plan for Sending Out Foreign Missionaries The Bristol Church, with which Mr. Muller was connected, has been privileged to set an example to the Church of God of the way in which foreign missionaries, who are so greatly needed, can be sent forth in answer to prayer. Mr. Muller writes on page 516, volume 1 of his narrative. I also mention here that during the eight years previous to my going to Germany to labour there, it had been laid upon my heart, and on the hearts of some other brethren among us, to ask the Lord that he would be pleased to honour us as a body of believers, by calling forth from our midst brethren, for carrying the truth into foreign lands. But this prayer seemed to remain unanswered. Now, however, the time was come when the Lord was about to answer it, and I, on whose heart particularly this matter had been laid, was to be the first to carry forth the truth from among us. About that very time the Lord called our dear brother and sister Barrington from among us to go to Demerara, to labour there in connection with our esteemed brother Strong, and our dear brother and sister Espenet to go to Switzerland. Both these dear brethren and sisters left very shortly after I had gone to Germany, but this was not all. Our much-valued brother Mordel, who had commended himself to the saints by his unwearied faithful service among us for twelve years, had from August the 31st, 1843, the day on which brothers Strong and Barrington sailed from Bristol for Demerara, his mind likewise exercised about service there, and went out from among us eleven months after. He, together with myself, had had it particularly laid upon his heart, during the eight years previously, to ask the Lord again and again to call labourers from among us for foreign service. Of all persons, he, the father of a large family, and about fifty years of age, seemed the least likely to be called to that work. But God did call him. He went, laboured a little while in Demerara, and then, on January the ninth, 1845, the Lord took him to his rest. When we ask God for a thing, such as that he would be pleased to raise up labourers for his harvest, or send means for the carrying on of his work, the honest question to be put to our hearts should be this, Am I willing to go, if he should call me? Am I willing to give according to my ability? For we may be the very persons whom the Lord will call for the work, or whose means he may wish to employ. In the report of the Scriptural Knowledge Institution for 1896, Mr. Muller shows how greatly this body of believers has been honoured by God. From our own midst, as a church, sixty brethren and sisters have gone forth to foreign fields of labour, some of whom have finished their labour on earth, but there are still about forty yet engaged in this precious service. Why should not the great and crying need for workers in Asia, Africa, and other parts of the world be thus met by thousands of churches in Europe and America, following this divine plan of praying the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth labourers from among them? Surely they may expect God to answer their prayers, as he did the prayers of this Bristol church. Look what has been done in China by the faithful use of God's method, we quote Mr. Hudson Taylor's words as given in China's Millions for July 1897. For the obtaining of fellow workers we took the Master's direction, Pray ye the Lord of the harvest. As for the first five before the mission was formed, so for the twenty-four for whom we first asked for the China Inland Mission, for further reinforcements when they were needed, for the seventy in three years, for the hundred in one year, and for further additions from time to time, we have ever relied on this plan. Is it possible that in any other way such a band of workers from nearly every denomination and from many lands could have been gathered and kept together for thirty years with no other bond save that which the call of God and the love of God has proved, a band now numbering over seven hundred men and women, aided by more than five hundred native workers? 
The Beginning of the 1859 Revival In November 1856, a young Irishman, Mr. James McQuilkin, was brought to the knowledge of the Lord. Soon after his conversion, he saw my narrative advertised, viz. the first two volumes of this book. He had a great desire to read it, and procured it accordingly, about January 1857. God blessed it greatly to his soul, especially in showing to him what could be obtained by prayer. He said to himself something like this, See what Mr. Muller obtains simply by prayer. Thus I may obtain blessing by prayer. He now set himself to pray that the Lord would give him a spiritual companion, one who knew the Lord. Soon after he became acquainted with a young man who was a believer. These two began a prayer meeting in one of the Sunday schools in the parish of Connor. Having his prayer answered in obtaining a spiritual companion, Mr. James McQuilkin asked the Lord to lead him to become acquainted with some more of his hidden ones. Soon after, the Lord gave him two more young men who were believers previously, as far as he could judge. In autumn 1857, Mr. James McQuilkin stated to these three young men, given him in answer to believing prayer, what blessing he had derived from my narrative, how it had led him to see the power of believing prayer, and he proposed that they should meet for prayer to seek the Lord's blessing upon their various labours in the Sunday schools, prayer meetings, and preaching of the gospel. Accordingly, in autumn 1857, these four young men met together for prayer in a small schoolhouse near the village of Kells, in the parish of Connor, every Friday evening. By this time, the great and mighty work of the Spirit in 1857 in the United States had become known, and Mr. James McQuilkin said to himself, Why may not we have such a blessed work here, seeing that God did such great things for Mr. Muller, simply in answer to prayer? On January the 1st, 1858, the Lord gave them the first remarkable answer to prayer in the conversion of a farm servant. He was taken into the number, and thus there were five who gave themselves to prayer. Shortly after, another young man, about twenty years old, was converted. There were now six. This greatly encouraged the other three who first had met with Mr. James McQuilkin, Others now were converted, who were also taken into the number, but only believers were admitted to these fellowship meetings, in which they read, prayed, and offered to each other a few thoughts from the Scriptures. These meetings and others, for the preaching of the Gospel, were held in the parish of Connor, Antrim, Ireland. Up to this time all was going on most quietly, though many souls were converted, there were no physical prostrations as afterwards. About Christmas, 1858, a young man from a hog hill, who had come to live at Connor, and who had been converted through this little company of believers, went to see his friends at a hog hill, and spoke to them about their own souls and the work of God at Connor. His friends desired to see some of these converts. Accordingly, Mr. James McQuilkin, with two of the first who met for prayer, went on February the 2nd, 1859, and held a meeting at a hog hill in one of the Presbyterian churches. Some believed, some mocked, and others thought there was a great deal of presumption in these young converts, yet many wished to have another meeting. This was held by the same three young men on February the 16th, 1859, and now the Spirit of God began to work, and to work mightily. Souls were converted, and from that time conversions multiplied rapidly. Some of these converts went to other places and carried the spiritual fire, so to speak, with them. The blessed work of the Spirit of God spread in many places. On April the 5th, 1859, Mr. James McQuilkin went to Ballymena, held a meeting there in one of the Presbyterian churches, and on April the 11th held another meeting in another of the Presbyterian churches. Several were convinced of sin, and the work of the Spirit of God went forward in Ballymena. On May the 28th, 1859, he went to Belfast. During the first week there were meetings held in five different Presbyterian churches, 
and from that time the blessed work commenced at Belfast. In all these visits he was accompanied and helped by Mr. Jeremiah Manili, one of the three young men who first met with him, after the reading of my narrative. From this time the work of the Holy Ghost spread further and further, for the young converts were used by the Lord to carry the truth from one place to another. Such was the beginning of that mighty work of the Holy Spirit, which has led to the conversion of hundreds of thousands, for some of my readers will remember how in 1859 this fire was kindled in England, Wales and Scotland, how it spread through Ireland, England, Wales and Scotland, how the continent of Europe was more or less partaking of this mighty working of the Holy Spirit, how it led thousands to give themselves to the work of evangelists, and how up to the year 1874 not only the effects of this work, first begun in Ireland, are felt, but that still more or less this blessed work is going on in Europe generally. It is almost needless to add that in no degree the honour is due to the instruments, but to the Holy Spirit alone. Yet these facts are stated in order that it may be seen what delight God has in answering abundantly the believing prayer of his children. Mr. Muller's Marriage in Volume 3 of the narrative, Mr. Muller shows the ordering of God in his meeting with, and subsequent marriage, to his first wife, Miss Mary Groves. In giving her to me, I own the hand of God, nay, his hand was most marked, and my soul says, Thou art good, and doest good. I refer to a few particulars for the instruction of others. When at the end of the year 1829 I left London to labour in Devonshire in the Gospel, a brother in the Lord gave me a card containing the address of a well-known Christian lady, Miss Paget, who then resided in Exeter, in order that I should call on her, as she was an excellent Christian. I took this address and put it into my pocket, but thought little of calling on her. Three weeks I carried this card in my pocket, without making an effort to see this lady, but at last I was led to do so. This was God's way of giving me my excellent wife. Miss Paget asked me to preach the last Sunday in the month of January, 1830, at the room which she had fitted up at Poltimore, a village near Exeter, and where Mr. A. N. Groves, afterwards my brother-in-law, had preached once a month, before he went out as a missionary to Baghdad. I accepted readily the invitation, as I longed everywhere to set forth the precious truth of the Lord's return, and other deeply important truths, which not long before my own soul had been filled with. On leaving Miss Paget, she gave me the address of a Christian brother, Mr. Hake, who had an infant boarding school for young ladies and gentlemen, at Northern Hay House, the former residence of Mr. A. N. Groves, in order that I might stay there on my arrival in Exeter from Tainmouth. To this place I went at the appointed time. Miss Groves, afterwards my beloved wife, was there, for Mrs. Hake had been a great invalid for a long time, and Miss Groves helped Mr. Hake in his great affliction by superintending his household matters. My first visit led to my going again to preach at Baltimore, after the lapse of a month, and I stayed again at Mr. Hake's house. And this second visit led to my preaching once a week in a chapel at Exeter. And thus I went week after week from Tainmouth to Exeter, each time staying in the house of Mr. Hake. All this time my purpose had been not to marry at all, but to remain free for travelling about in the service of the gospel. But after some months I saw, for many reasons, that it was better for me, as a young pastor, under twenty-five years of age, to be married. The question now was, to whom should I be united? Miss Groves was before my mind, but the prayerful conflict was long before I came to a decision, for I could not bear the thought that I should take away from Mr. Hake his valued helper, as Mrs. Hake continued still unable to take the responsibility of so large a household. But I prayed again and again. At last this decided me, 
I had reason to believe that I had begotten an affection in the heart of Miss Groves for me, and that therefore I ought to make a proposal of marriage to her, however unkindly I might appear to act to my dear friend and brother Mr. Hake, and to ask God to give him a suitable helper to succeed Miss Groves. On August the 15th, 1830, I therefore wrote to her, proposing to her to become my wife, and on August the 19th, when I went over as usual to Exeter for preaching, she accepted me. The first thing we did, after I was accepted, was to fall on our knees, and to ask the blessing of the Lord on our intended union. In about two or three weeks, the Lord, in answer to prayer, found an individual who seemed suitable to act as housekeeper, whilst Mrs. Hake continued ill. And on October the 7th, 1830, we were united in marriage. Our marriage was of the most simple character. We walked to church, had no wedding breakfast, but in the afternoon had a meeting of Christian friends in Mr. Hake's house, and commemorated the Lord's death and then I drove off in the stagecoach with my beloved bride to Tainmouth, and the next day we went to work for the Lord. Simple as our beginning was, and unlike the habits of the world, for Christ's sake, so our godly aim has been to continue ever since. Now see the hand of God in giving me my dearest wife. First, that address of Miss Paget's was given to me under the ordering of God, Second, I must at last be made to call on her, though I had long delayed it. Third, she might have provided a resting place with some other Christian friend, where I should not have seen Miss Groves. Fourth, my mind might have at last, after all, decided not to make a proposal to her. But God settled the matter thus in speaking to me through my conscience. You know that you have begotten affection in the heart of this Christian sister, by the way you have acted towards her, and therefore, painful though it may be to appear to act unkindly towards your friend and brother, you ought to make her a proposal. I obeyed. I wrote the letter in which I made the proposal, and nothing but one even stream of blessing has been the result. Let me here add a word of Christian counsel. To enter upon the marriage union, is one of the most deeply important events of life. It cannot be too prayerfully treated. Our happiness, our usefulness, our living for God or for ourselves afterwards, are often most intimately connected with our choice. Therefore, in the most prayerful manner this choice should be made. Neither beauty, nor age, nor money, nor mental powers should be that which prompt the decision. But first, much waiting upon God for guidance should be used. Second, a hearty purpose to be willing to be guided by Him should be aimed after. Third, true godliness without a shadow of doubt should be the first and absolutely needful qualification to a Christian with regard to a companion for life. In addition to this, however, it ought to be at the same time calmly and patiently weighed whether in other respects there is a suitableness. For instance, for an educated man to choose an entirely uneducated woman is unwise, for however much on his part love might be willing to cover the defect, it will work very unhappily with regard to the children. Dangerous Illness of Mr. Muller's Daughter In July 1853, it pleased the Lord to try my faith in a way in which before it had not been tried. My beloved daughter and only child, and a believer since the commencement of the year 1846, was taken ill on June the 20th. This illness, at first a low fever, turned to typhus. On July the 3rd there seemed no hope of her recovery. Now was the trial of faith. But faith triumphed. My beloved wife and I were enabled to give her up into the hands of the Lord. He sustained us both exceedingly. But I will only speak about myself. Though my only and beloved child was brought near the grave, yet was my soul in perfect peace, satisfied with the will of my heavenly Father, being assured that he would only do that for her and her parents 
which in the end would be the best. She continued very ill till about July the 20th, when restoration began. On August the 18th, she was so far restored that she could be removed to Clevedon for change of air, though exceedingly weak. It was then fifty-nine days since she was first taken ill. Parents know what an only child, a beloved child is, and what to believing parents an only child, a believing child must be. Well, the Father in heaven said, as it were, by this his dispensation, Art thou willing to give up this child to me? My heart responded, As it seems good to thee, my heavenly Father, thy will be done. But as our hearts were made willing to give back our beloved child to him who had given her to us, so he was ready to leave her to us, and she lived. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thy heart. Psalm 37 verse 4 the desires of my heart were to retain the beloved daughter, if it were the will of God. The means to retain her were to be satisfied with the will of the Lord. Of all the trials of faith that as yet I have had to pass through, this was the greatest, and by God's abundant mercy, I own it to his praise, I was enabled to delight myself in the will of God, for I felt perfectly sure that if the Lord took this beloved daughter, it would be best for her parents, best for herself, and more for the glory of God than if she lived. This better part I was satisfied with, and thus my heart had peace, perfect peace, and I had not a moment's anxiety. Thus would it be, under all circumstances, however painful, were the believer exercising faith. THE DAILY BREAD AUGUST THE 3RD, 1844 SATURDAY With the twelve shillings we began the day. My soul said, I will now look out for the way in which the Lord will deliver us this day again, for he will surely deliver. Many Saturdays, when we were in need, he helped us, and so he will do this day also. Between nine and ten o'clock this morning I gave myself to prayer for means with three of my fellow labourers in my house. Whilst we were in prayer, there was a knock at my room door, and I was informed that a gentleman had come to see me. When we'd finished prayer, it was found to be a brother from Tetbury, who had brought from Barnstable one pound two shillings and sixpence for the orphans. Thus we have one pound fourteen shillings and sixpence, with which I must return the letter-bag to the orphan house, looking to the Lord for more. August the 6th. Without one single penny in my hands, the day began. The post brought nothing, nor had I yet received anything, when ten minutes after ten this morning the letter-bag was brought from the orphan-houses for the supplies of to-day. Now see the Lord's deliverance. In the bag I found a note from one of the labourers in the orphan-houses, enclosing two sovereigns, which she sent for the orphans stating that it was part of a present which she just received unexpectedly for herself. Thus we are supplied for today. September the 4th. Only one farthing was in my hands this morning. Pause a moment, dear reader. Only one farthing in hand when the day commenced. Think of this, and think of nearly a 140 persons to be provided for. You, poor brethren, who have six or eight children, and small wages, think of this. And you, my brethren, who do not belong to the working classes, but have, as it is called, very limited means, think of this. May you not do what we do under your trials. Does the Lord love you less than he loves us? Does he not love all his children with no less love than that with which he loves his only begotten Son, according to John 17, verses 20 to 23? Or are we better than you? Nay, are we not in ourselves poor miserable sinners as you are? And have any of the children of God any claim upon God, on account of their own worthiness? Is not that which alone can make us worthy to receive anything from our Heavenly Father, the righteousness of the Lord Jesus, 
which is imputed to those who believe in him. Therefore, dear reader, as we pray in our every need, of whatever character it may be, in connection with this work, to our Father in heaven for help, and as he does help us, so is he willing to help all his children who put their trust in him. Well, let us hear then how God helped when there was only one farthing left in my hands on the morning of September the 4th, 1844. A little after nine o'clock I received a sovereign from a sister in the Lord who does not wish the name of the place where she resides mentioned. Between ten and eleven o'clock the bag was sent from the orphan houses in which in a note it was stated that one pound and two shillings was required for today. Scarcely had I read this, when a fly stopped before my house, and a gentleman from the neighbourhood of Manchester was announced. I found that he was a believer who had come on business to Bristol. He had heard about the orphan houses, and expressed his surprise that without any regular system of collections, and without personal application to anyone, simply by faith and prayer, I obtained two thousand and more yearly for the work of the Lord in my hands. This brother, whom I had never seen before, and whose name I did not even know before he came, gave me two pounds, as an exemplification of what I had stated to him. THE POOR WITH YOU ALWAYS February the 12th, 1845 After I had sent off this morning the money which was required for the housekeeping of today, I had again only sixteen shillings, tuppence halfpenny left, being only about one-fourth as much as is generally needed for one day, merely for housekeeping, so that there was now again a fresh call for trusting in the Lord. In the morning I met again as usual with my dear wife and her sister for prayer, to ask the Lord for many blessings in connection with this work, and for means also. About one hour after I received a letter from Devonshire, containing an order for twenty-two pounds, of which ten pounds was for the orphans, two pounds for a poor brother in Bristol, and ten pounds for myself. Besides having thus a fresh proof of the willingness of our Heavenly Father to answer our requests on behalf of the orphans, there is this, moreover, to be noticed. For many months past, the necessities of the poor saints among us have been particularly laid upon my heart, the word of the Lord, ye have the poor with you always, and whensoever ye will, ye may do them good, has again and again stirred me up to prayer on their behalf, and thus it was again in particular this morning. It was the coldest morning we've had the whole winter. In my morning walk for prayer and meditation, I thought how well I was supplied with coals, nourishing food and warm clothing, and how many of the dear children of God might be in need. And I lifted up my heart to God to give me more means for myself, that I might be able, by actions, to show more abundant sympathy with the poor believers in their need. And it was but three hours after when I received this ten pounds for myself. The Lord Directing the Steps February the 1st, 1847 before breakfast I took a direction in my usual morning's walk, in which I had not been for many weeks, feeling drawn in that direction, just as if God had an intention in leading me in that way. Returning home I met a Christian gentleman whom, formerly, I used to meet almost every morning, but whom I had not met for many weeks, because I had not been walking in that direction. He stopped me and gave me two pounds for the orphans, then I knew why I had been led thus, for there is not yet enough in hand to supply the matrons tomorrow evening with the necessary means for housekeeping during another week. February the 4th. Yesterday nothing had come in. This morning, just before I was going to give myself to prayer about the orphans, a sister in the Lord sent a sovereign which she had received, as she writes, from a friend who had met the orphan boys, and was particularly pleased with their neat and orderly appearance. After having received this pound, I prayed for means for present use, though not confining my prayers to that. About a quarter of an hour after I had risen from my knees, I received a setter with an order for five pounds. 
The donor writes that it is the proceeds of a strip of land sold to the railway company. What various means does the Lord employ to send us help in answer to our prayers? Continued Trials of Faith and Patience With the enlargement of the work, by which some 330 persons needed to be provided for, the trials of faith continued, Mr. Muller writes. If we formerly had no certain income, so now we have none. We have to look to God for everything in connection with the work, of which often, however, the pecuniary necessities are the smallest matter. But to Him we are enabled to look, and therefore it is that we are not disappointed. October the 7th, 1852 This evening there was only eight pounds left in hand for the current expenses for the orphans. Hitherto we had generally abounded, but though much had come in since the commencement of this new period, yet our expenses had been greater than our income, as every donation almost of which the disposal was left with me had been put to the building fund. Thus the balance in hand on May the 26th, 1852, notwithstanding the large income since then, was reduced to about eight pounds. I therefore gave myself particularly to prayer for means that this small sum might be increased. October the 9th. This morning, Luke 7 came in the course of my reading before breakfast. While reading the account about the centurion and the raising from death the widow's son at Nain, I lifted up my heart to the Lord Jesus thus. Lord Jesus, Thou hast the same power now, Thou canst provide me with means for thy work in my hands. Be pleased to do so. About half an hour afterwards, I received two hundred and thirty pounds and fifteen shillings. The joy which such answers to prayer afford cannot be described. I was determined to wait upon God only, and not to work an unscriptural deliverance for myself. I have thousands of pounds for the building fund, but I would not take of this sum, because it was once set apart for that object. There is also a legacy of a hundred pounds for the orphans, two months overdue, in the prospect of the payment of which the heart might be naturally inclined to use some money of the building fund, to be replaced by the legacy money when it comes in. But I would not thus step out of God's way of obtaining help. At the very time when this donation arrived, I had packed up a hundred pounds which I happened to have in hand, received for the building fund, in order to take it to the bank, as I was determined not to touch it, but to wait upon God. My soul does magnify the Lord for his goodness. June the 13th, 1853. We were now very poor, not indeed in debt, nor was even all the money gone, for there was still about twelve pounds in hand. But then there was needed to be bought flour, of which we generally buy ten sacks at a time, three hundred stones of oatmeal, four hundred weight of soap, and there were many little repairs going on in the house with a number of workmen, besides the regular current expenses of about seventy pounds per week. Over and above all this, on Saturday, the day before yesterday, I found that the heating apparatus needed to be repaired, which would cost in all probability twenty-five pounds. It was therefore desirable, humanly speaking, to have a hundred pounds for these heavy extra expenses, besides means for the current expenses. But I had no human prospect whatever of getting even a hundred pence, much less a hundred pounds. In addition to this, today was Monday, when generally the income is little. But in walking to the orphan house this morning, and praying as I went, I particularly told the Lord in prayer that on this day, though Monday, he could send me much. And thus it was. I received this morning three hundred and one pounds for the Lord's service, as might be most needed. The joy which I had cannot be described. I walked up and down in my room for a long time, tears of joy and gratitude to the Lord raining plentifully over my cheeks, praising and magnifying the Lord for his goodness, and surrendering myself afresh with all my heart to him for his blessed service. 
I scarcely ever felt more the kindness of the Lord in helping me. November the 9th. Our need of means is now great, very great. The Lord tries our faith and patience. This afternoon a brother and sister in the Lord from Gloucestershire called to see me at the new orphan house before going through the house. After a few minutes I received from the sister a sovereign which she had been requested to bring to me for the building fund, and she gave me from herself one pound for my own personal expenses, and one pound for the building fund, and her husband gave me five pounds for the orphans, and five pounds for foreign missions. Thus the Lord has refreshed my spirit greatly, but I look for more, and need much more. November the 12th. This evening, while praying for means, came a little parcel containing ten sovereigns from a Christian lady, living not far from the new orphan house. This was a very great refreshment to my spirit. October the 17th, 1854. This morning, at family prayer, came, in the course of reading, Exodus 5, which shows that, just before the deliverance of the Israelites out of Egypt, their trials were greater than ever. They had not only to make the same number of bricks as before, but also to gather stubble, as no straw was given them any longer. This led me, in expounding the portion, to observe that even now the children of God are often in greater trial than ever, just before help and deliverance comes. Immediately after family prayer, it was found that, by the morning's post, not one penny had come in for the work of the Lord in which I am engaged, though we needed much, and though but very little had come in during the three previous days. Thus I had now to remember Exodus 5, and to practice the truths contained therein. In the course of the day nothing was received. In the evening I had, as usual, a season for prayer with my dear wife, respecting the various objects of the Scriptural Knowledge Institution, and then we left the new orphan house for our home. When we arrived at our house, about nine o'clock, we found that five pounds, and also five shillings, had been sent from Norwich in two post office orders for the building fund, and that eight pounds, three shillings, and eleven pence had been sent in for Bibles, tracts, and reports, which had been sold. This called for thanksgiving, but a little later, between nine and ten o'clock, a Christian gentleman called and gave me one pound for the orphans, and two hundred pounds for foreign missions. He had received these sums from an aged Christian woman, whose savings as a servant during her whole life made up the two hundred pounds, and who, having recently had left to her a little annual income of about thirty pounds, felt herself constrained by the love of Christ to send the savings of her whole life for foreign missions. Our especial prayer had been again and again that the Lord would be pleased to send in means for missionary brethren, as I had reason to believe they were in much need of help. And only at eight o'clock this evening I had particularly besought the Lord to send help for this object. By the last mail I had sent off forty pounds to British Guyana to help seven brethren there in some measure. This amount took the last pound in hand for this object. How gladly would I have sent assistance to other brethren also, but I had no more. Now I am in some degree supplied for this object. July the 12th, 1854 Our means were now again reduced to about thirty pounds, as only about a hundred and fifty pounds had come in since June the 15th. In addition to this, we had very heavy expenses before us. This morning... In reading through the book of Proverbs, when I came to chapter 22, verse 19, that thy trust may be in the Lord, etc., I said in prayer to him, Lord, I do trust in thee, but wilt thou now be pleased to help me, for I am in need of means for the current expenses of all the various objects of the institution. By the first delivery of letters, I received an order on a London bank for a hundred pounds to be used for all the various objects as the present need might require. 